uh, we shall begin. <clears throat> I just want to say good afternoon. This is Brian Jackson with Abacus Technologies uh, for our webinar today, uh, June 16th. Uh, we'll be talking about desktop as a service um, and talking about how it may benefit you. We've also got a special guest uh, here on the webinar with us today. We have Paul Lee from Green Crowd Technologies. We'll be introducing him and learning about one more about him in just a minute. I uh, just want to remind everyone who may be attending, we uh, will be recording this webinar and uh, shortly after uh, it concludes, we'll do our best to get it up on our YouTube channel. Uh, so you can uh, go back and watch it if, uh, if we miss something. Also, if uh, you maybe didn't have an opportunity to watch it the first time around, I can't finish it, then uh, you ha can go back and rewatch it if you want to. Uh, as always, uh, feel free to ask any questions throughout the webinar. Um, you know, I try to encourage that and would love to get those questions answered as quickly as possible. Uh, so uh, we can uh, do that live. Uh, you can simply just uh, go down to the menu bar and go to the question and answer section and just type in your question there. And then we will uh, respond to it live. And uh, that way you can get whatever information you need uh, for that question. Um, so today's agenda, um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about Abacus and Green Cloud, uh, that partnership that we have with them, which allows us to have Paul as our guest today. Uh, we're going to talk a little, we're going to let Paul introduce himself and talk a little bit about Green Cloud and what they can bring to the table. Uh, we're going to focus uh, primarily on one of the services, which is Desktop as a Service, or otherwise known as DAS. Uh, how does it work? Benefits, use cases. So Paul is going to provide some information on that. And uh, we'll be able to chime, my team will be able to chime in on that as well. Uh, we're actually going to see a demo of it. So we we'll asked Paul to queue up uh, a DAS uh, session. I believe he's going to use the session that he uses every day. Uh, so he is a DAS user himself. So I can't think of anyone else better to demo it than someone who uh, uses it every day. And then in, uh, at the end, we'll have a little time for additional Q&A if we need to. We're going to try to keep it around 30 to 45 minutes today. So, uh, so bear with us on that. So, uh, I'm going to start out just talking about a little bit about Abacus and Green Cloud and our partnership. Uh, you know, you know, Abacus is always, a, as a company, we've always uh, been uh, on the lookout for you know the absolute best companies to partner with uh, to provide uh, all types of services to our clients and. Uh, we've had a partnership with Green Cloud for, you know, I'd say four to five years now, um, you know, and that, that uh, partnership started off on a, on a great run uh, as we uh, moved a, a rather large company, you know, from an on-premise solution uh, to their infrastructure as a service solution. And uh, they were great to work with. I know Lee Kennedy, who uh, is on the line with us, did a lot of that project himself to work directly with the Green Cloud team. I know he had a lot of great things to say about him. And I will say over the, the four to five years that uh, that client was running on Green Cloud, uh, they had very few issues. And uh, they, they maximized uptime and, uh, and were definitely happy with uh, everything, every service that was provided with Green Cloud. Uh, we're a partner with them. We resell their services. We have access to their resources. Uh, and uh, we have enjoyed being a partner with them. So. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to introduce uh, Paul Lee. He's uh, one of the channel account managers, uh, I think, national channel account managers. Is that right, Paul? That is right, Brian. Yeah. All right. Um, He's the yeah. nat national channel account manager at Green Cow Technologies. And I'm going to turn it over to him and let him tell us a little bit about himself and his journey to Green Cloud. So, Paul, uh, tell us about how did you get started with Green Cloud? What's your background? Brian, I really appreciate it. Um, I think that the national part of my title is just a fancy way of saying that I, I don't necessarily have a territory and uh, I am expected to be in, in a lot of places at, at a lot of different times uh, throughout the year. So <laughs> um, with that said, I'll, I'll kind of kick us off here with just a little bit of information about myself and, and kind of my journey so far with, uh, with Green Cloud. <clears throat> Uh, it, it, which has been great so far. So uh, I joined Green Cloud in September of 2015. So I'm, I'm very close uh, upcoming to, to, to my five-year mark here with the company. Um, when I started at the company, I actually started in, in, in the very bottom rung um, 
as a sales development rep, uh, helping to uh, recruit potential partners uh, like Abacus um, kind of into the, the Green Cloud Partner Network. Uh, it, was, it, it was a lot of calling, a lot of emailing in a day, but um, it was one of the hardest jobs, but yet at the same time, one of the most rewarding that I've, I've had, I've had in, 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 in my journey so far uh, uh, in, in life. So um, in my previous life, uh, I was actually a part of a company that did automotive packaging solutions. Um, and, and Brian, I don't know if we've ever had a chance to really talk about this, but I was in Birmingham and, and Montgomery uh, at, the, at the Kia and Hyundai plants. Uh, okay. For 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 quite a bit of the year, um, I, I I was what, what I like to consider kind of the the, the cultural connection um, into in, into Hyundai and, and Kia specifically. So it, kind of in that regard, um, I, I was sales support and sales engineering um, really uh, being presented <clears throat> with problems that 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 had certain parameters uh, that that needed solutions. Um, it really kind of prepped me for for this role kind of kind of today. Um, I'm an extremely competitive person. If if I am not uh, in front of my computer or in front of clients, then you will a lot of times find me uh, out in the local golf outings uh, on the weekends. Um, I'm also quite a bit of an adrenaline junkie. I love, uh, I've skateboarded and, and snowboarded my whole life. Um, I love downhill mountain biking. And if I'm not doing that, then, then I may be bombing, uh, bombing through Atlanta traffic uh, on my bicycle <laughs> during rush hour. <laughs> well, I noticed uh, in our call the other day, you had some, I believe those were skateboards on the wall behind you. Was I correct in that? That's, that's exactly right. Yep. Um, some, some old relics of the past, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I used to, I, I, you know, skateboarding was something I did, you know, when I was one of those, uh, you know, popping off teenagers, I, I really enjoyed boarding as well. So I had my... <laughs> My uh, my little skateboard I used to ride around on, and I finally, I finally got to upgrade. So I was it had the handles on the side. It was a lot of fun. So yeah, that's uh can't do it there anymore though. A little bit too old to skateboard now, but <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's a, that's a great connection. I like uh, mountain biking too. You like to go downhill mountain biking. So where's some places in Atlanta you go downhill mountain biking at? I, I love it. Yep. So there's a there's a place here. It's it's a little out west. Um, actually towards you, towards you all. It's called the Cherahala Skyway. Um, and there's okay. some incredible, there's some incredible downhill mountain biking over there. Um, I love going up, you know, back up towards South Carolina in the Seneca Clemson area. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry for any uh, University of South Carolina fans on the call today, uh, <laughs> but, but that they also have some great, some, some great kind of foothills across country and downhill mountain biking there as well. So what kind of bike do you run? Uh, right now, it's a it's a specialized uh, rock hopper. Um, oh. I've had it for over over ten years now, probably. It's it's probably on its last legs, but I think I can I think I can beat it up for a couple more years. <laughs> yeah, I got to do a, a sort of a adventure race, and uh, I borrowed a specialized from one of my friends, and it was it was an amazing ride. I've actually been trying to find a used one somewhere. I thought it was a, a great light bike, and it, and it worked really well. So. So oh, how yeah. did you make, so tell me about the transition from uh, the, the automotive industry to green cloud. How did that transition go uh, note for you? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, Brian. So um, this is probably a case of, uh, of, of who I knew at the time. Um, one of my, one of my very good friends whom I worked with at the automotive packaging company, um, his, his older brother actually ran the, the sales and development team. Uh, here at Green Cloud at the time, and so um, he kind of understood my role at my previous company, and and he thought that um, my attitude and and my work ethic would be beneficial to the the type of role that that is the sales development role. So um, it was very much kind of a a match made in heaven, and in, in that regard, uh, I, I had no disillusions about what the role was while going in. You know, um, I I attribute actually a lot of my success today to, to, to that person who hired me at green cloud originally. Um, uh, the transition was, was pretty smooth. The, the, the phone calling aspect uh, every day that, that took a little bit of getting used to, but uh, after it's really one of those roles where after you hit your stride, it, it really becomes, um, it really becomes second nature, if you will. So, so if you came to green cloud in 2015, I guess you have been there for, you know, the, the time when they probably experienced their most growth and most success in the market. I guess Absolutely. you contribute, you are a direct contributor to that. 
um, yes, I, I guess I've never thought of it that way, Brian, but yeah, absolutely. I, I like to feel that way at least. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, I, I pulled some of the accolades on Green Cloud and, you know, just uh, one of the fastest growing companies in South Carolina, uh, you know, several uh, entrepreneur awards, uh, you know, the 5000 Inc. Award at 16, 17, 18. So it sounds like you have, you got you've been part of a, a, you know, a very successful effort uh, there at Green Cloud. Uh, as they've, I know they've grown tremendously over the year, and it's not just they've grown in size and revenue, but it seemed like, uh, you know, as we get into learning more about Green Cloud, the services you guys have have begun to offer seems like they have just expanded tremendously over the past couple of years as well. That's exactly right, Brian, um, and and thank you for bringing that up because the, I, I think the the evolution um, of how we got to this point is, is important as well. Um, I think that that the story from a Green Cloud perspective is actually very cool too. Um, we were founded in in 2011. And, 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 if, and for anybody on the call who, who may be, um, who may have been familiar with, with kind of the telecom space back in the late, late 2000s, um, uh, the, the name Nubox may ring a bell. Windstream probably rings a bell as well. The, the founding fathers of Green Cloud built uh, Nubox uh, and then exited the company after Windstream actually acquired them. Um, so uh, at the time, they were thinking, hey, let's, we, we, have, we have seen kind of an evolution in, in the managed services provider space. Um, and, and I would say that we were even a bit ahead of the curve in terms of providing um, infrastructure as a service solutions at the time. So um, what happened is they, they walked across the street, they opened the doors of, of, of Green Cloud Technologies. Um, very interestingly enough, uh, the, 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 the basis of the company at the time was still infrastructure as a service, and it is still today a, a, a bread and butter service of, of Green Cloud. Um, but what was layered on top of it may, may actually surprise some people. It was actually hosted PBX. <clears throat> and at the time, if, if anybody's kind of familiar with it, I would, I would consider kind of that, that technology to be in its teenage years, probably around that time. Um, and, and it was, it was suffice to say it, it was a, it, it was, it was kind of fickle in, in nature. Um, what was interesting at the time is that the, our co-founders, they, they were seeing what was happening in the managed services space. They saw the need for infrastructure as a service and then kind of the modern day version of green cloud was born. Um, from there, we started to roll out disaster recovery services as well. Um, backup as a service. A desktop as a service, and then in its later years, a uh, security operations center as a service as well, kind of uh, referencing the, the R services section on the slide that you have up right now, Brian. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things I think of, you know, you talk about infrastructure as a service, and for those who may not know exactly what that is, uh, you know, basically, you know, most companies start out with their infrastructure on premise. Uh, you know, they're in, in an on premise data center, a closet, you know, whatever it may be, and what green cloud has been able to offer and i've seen you know is a, a cloud version of that so basically uh you know you can take that those, those on-premise servers you can migrate to their infrastructure as a service and have your servers live in their data centers in their cloud on on their architecture and uh and i think one of the biggest benefits to me is is you can is the flexibility of, of the IaaS product the fact that you can you know, you can scale up the, the resources you need. You can scale them back. You can, uh, you know, stand them up, tear them down. But it's like, like you said, that's the core of it. And, and now y'all have been able to stack these other services on top of that. They complement it very well, where now you could take, I guess, any company's infrastructure, their backup, their DR, their using their, even their workstation experience, and then overlay even the security on top of it. So really, you guys have become a, a full solution for a company all the way around. That's exactly right, Brian. And, and I couldn't have said that better myself. Um, at the end of the day, this is exactly the, the, the type of company that we wanted to be to, to our partners. And, um, I, and I will take a second here to, to, to kind of um, put some perspective into this as well. So the, uh, a cornerstone of the Green Cloud business uh, model is that we are a 100% a channel only. Um, so in a more simplistic term, um, what that all that means is that we have absolutely zero direct sales force. Um, this affords us both the bandwidth and the expertise 
to be able to support our partners like Abacus. Um, this allows us to be experts in, in a single kind of pillar of IT being cloud and cloud infrastructure, backup, DR, and, 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 and security as well. I know one of the things I've always been impressed with is you guys really have chosen the best and breed partners. I mean, you have Cisco on board, you have VMware on board, uh, Veeam, Zerto, and then the newest partner is Infogressive. I know we've worked with you guys on uh, and working with them here recently. So, you know, what, you know, when you look at that, that's a, that's a nice lineup. So how did you guys arrive at those partners? And what does that process look like to get those partners in place? Yeah, um, that, that's, uh, that's a great observation too, Brian. So um, I, I will kind of point out the obvious here, a, as you did. Um, all, of those, uh, all of those companies, and, and the te- if you looked at the technology stack itself, um, I would imagine for a, a lot of us that those are extremely recognizable names. Um, mm-hmm. I think it, it's important to point out that, that we as GreenCloud, um, instead of going down the kind of the, hey, let's, let's make something proprietary, um, let's try to build something from the ground up. What we actually recognized was that there were there was really good uh, best of breed technology that was already out there in, in that existed in the space today, but all it took was some smart people to bring those services together and integrate them into an architecture, and that's what we see today. Um, in a more general and kind of broad sense. I would say that this that this would apply to 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 not just cloud providers like us, um, but for managed services providers as well. Uh, it, it is a, a big part of our job is to bring together these solutions that are out there in a way that it makes sense for the for our end customers, right? Right. And and finally, talk about your locations. I know uh, corporate headquarters is in South Carolina, in the Greenville area, mm-hmm. but uh, it looks like y'all. I mean, you guys are basically are nationwide, right? That's correct. Yep. Um, the the map is a, is a very good representation of this. Um, we are spread we are spread across pretty uh pretty widely. Um, we're very we, we are very much concentrated in in the southeast. Uh, I think that was uh, it, it was very organic on our part, a part of our growth, um, kind of growing out of of our headquarter location here in in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, but you'll see we have we have locations you know as far as Phoenix and uh, and as north as Minneapolis. Um, it, it, it is important to note too, Brian, that that all of the all of the hardware is owned and operated by by, by Green Cloud engineers. Um, of which I'll make a quick comment on too. So today we are probably um, an eighty person company. Uh, as for the people, as for the number of employees who are in a role as, such as mine or similar to mine, we probably only have eight or so. So, all the rest of Green Clouds, all the rest of Green Clouds resources and employees, they are engineers, they are architects, they are they are support personnel. Um, and so that's a, that's all something that that I like to point out as well. Um, and we are constantly kind of expanding our presences, um, evaluating. Uh, where we should put a, a, a new data center presence, um, for example, um, or, or where to revamp where we need to. Awesome. And I guess all, all of you guys are that's American-based engineers, American-based support. Uh, so everything, all that comes from uh, those locations uh, in America, right? That's absolutely correct. Yes, sir. All right. So today, you know, that I, I want everybody to make sure we understand Green Cloud, <clears throat> what they have to bring to the table. But, you know, today we, we're going to focus on desktop as a service. So if you could sort of define desktop as a service, Paul, how would you define that uh, for us? Yeah, absolutely, Brian. So um, I, I will kind of reference uh, what you were saying about um, taking uh, servers that may be on premise uh, to the cloud. Um, Obviously, the the big thing that I want to focus on is is centralizing centralizing IT resources. And I think mm-hmm. if we look at it from that kind of window, then desktop as a service starts to make uh, a, it starts to become a little bit easier to understand. So um, I will lay it out kind of in this basic manner. So today, um, if you if you look at your laptop, your desktop machine, you may have a thin client um, or a thick client, uh, whatever it may be. Um, that is an isolated uh, an isolated endpoint in which we do all of our computing needs on in, in most instances, right? So 
what desktop as a service aims to achieve is that it is taking that isolated desktop, that isolated endpoint, and centralizing it in the cloud, just as you would with, with, with a server that may be on premise. So the resulting, so what happens as a result is that the endpoint at which you work as your, that your fingers actually touch on a day to day basis, um, that literally becomes a keyboard and a monitor allowing you to access centralized resources such as servers and desktops within the cloud. Um, we, we can start to unpack this a little bit, but as you can probably start already imagining, um, this opens up a lot more possibilities in terms of how uh, your endpoints within our organization are both managed, implemented, secured, and so on and so forth. So let's sort of talk about one of the, some of those individually. So we talk about, you know, I guess from the, the end user experience, I know we're going to do a demo in a few minutes, but uh, you know, how, how does that work for the end user? I mean, what does that sort of describe how that may look like? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I, I thank you for pulling up the, the architecture diagram. I, and for all of the uh, and for all of our listeners today, I, I won't go into the I won't go into the technical jargon today. But but this serves as a really good kind of high level of of what uh, the 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 layouts of what the logical layout of, of desktop as a service is. So I'm referencing I'm referencing the infographic right now. But as you can see. Um, the, the, the endpoints are now, it, it, while they used to be hardware, now what happens is, and, and it'll become clear in the demo, um, you are able to log in securely through a client, which looks like any kind of other icon that would be on your local machine. Um, and what it does is it establishes a secure connection into, um, and I'm referencing the bottom half now of the infographic, of the DAS desktop clusters. Um, so this is kind of what I meant by centralizing, by centralizing a, 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 and sending to the cloud a desktop. So um, your workstation, although you are still accessing it from a local machine that you're totally used to working with, um, it is not you, you, the the desktop is not actually on that local machine any longer. It is actually within the cloud. Um, so something else that I always like to point out is that if you look to the left of the DAS machines, um, you will see that that is where infrastructure as a service lives. And this is kind of <clears throat> this is an important point that I always like to point out is that uh, the the best practices uh, the they 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 basically say to to have the infrastructure, which means an organization's uh, servers um, live right next to the the, desk, the the virtualized desktops as well. And this is basically what this diagram is laying out. So um, what that means from an end user experience is that uh, there is no disconnect between um, their, the, the applications and data that resides on the customer servers and how they're actually accessing that through the, the virtual desktop itself. So, so basically with the desktop as a service, it gives the end users the flexibility to almost access their own personal desktop from any machine. And I guess any place they really have an internet connection, you even have, uh, you know, mobile devices on here, you know, would this work like with an iPad or a tablet? Would it, I guess anything with a browser, you could basically access your desktop in the cloud. Is that way it would work? That's exactly correct, Brian. Yes, um, I have seen I have seen it used on tablets. I have attempted it on my Android phone as well. Um, it, as you can imagine, it's it's a, a phone screen is a little small to see an entire desktop, right. but that works as well. So it's it's truly that the point I'm getting to is that it is truly bring your own device. Um, and what I mean by that is that it it, it allows a true a uh, solution to where you, you no longer have to accept the, the capital expenditure burden of having to buy compute power on an endpoint basis. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden before where you had to buy maybe an SSD, a, a machine with an SSD, uh, a certain, a certain clock speed for a CPU and then a, a you know, a bunch of Ram. Um, if we were to if we were to utilize the, the desktop as a service solution, um, all of a sudden you, you can now be rolling out a two hundred dollar Chromebook, right. um, and 
and, and using that in, instead. So it, it definitely, it truly brings BYOD into play as well. So let's talk about the current situation with COVID-19, you know, everybody going and working from home, you know, what kind of response have you seen? Have you seen a lot of uh, businesses start adopting desktop as a service, uh, you know, because they have more remote workers? Is that a trend you've been seeing here lately uh, with the pandemic going on? That is absolutely the case, Brian. Yes. Um, a lot of, of, of remote desktop solutions as well. Um, and a lot of, of, of DAS too. So um, what's very interesting is that uh, we have found that customers who were utilizing desktop as a service before the kind of the COVID world that we live in today, um, their transition to, to a shelter at home or, or, or work from home status, um, it, was, it was almost totally seamless. Um, and this is something that, that I can actually attribute to personally as well. Um, like Brian referenced kind of at the beginning of this call, I am a, a daily DAS user. Every employee at Green Cloud, uh, we, every single one of us uses DAS. Um, Brian and I were kind of going back and forth about our day before the webinar began. But uh, I, I made the comment about how, you know, in, in, a, in a previous life, it feels like at this point, uh, I would be in, in a car, on a plane, in an Uber, uh, in a hotel all the time. And, and for me as a DAS user, uh, that experience of being able to work out of my work uh, computer, um, it made that totally seamless. And so when, so when I transitioned into a shelter in place kind of situation, um, for me, it was, it, there was absolutely nothing different. And I think the same sentiment is shared by organizations who were using DAS before, um, whereas it, uh, it, you may have had to go home and establish a, a complex SSL system, uh, mm -hmm. a SSL client. Um, what ended up happening was that these companies who are already utilizing DAS, uh, they, they installed the Horizon clients on their endpoint and then sent them home. And then all of a sudden they had a super easy and secure way to, to, to get to uh, the company's infrastructure or the company's IT resources, I should say. I know when we were working with, we had probably a, a two to three week blitz of, uh, you know, companies trying to get the work from home set up, uh, you know, done right, done securely, you know, some were more successful than others. And I know there was a huge run of laptops. Uh, you know, we, we had uh, clients trying to order laptops, trying to go to Best Buy, this wherever they could get them. Uh, and that you really can get them. They're, they're really hard to come by. And, and you bring a good point about, hey, you don't have to have this super powerful laptop. I mean, I look at what I'm running. I've got a, I got a Core i7, 16 gigs of RAM. I mean, I'm an IT guy. I've got to have a, a stacked laptop, right? But with desktop right. as a service, you mentioned like a Chromebook. I mean, a Chromebook is, hey, that's a simple processor, low means of RAM. So even if something as simple as that, that can work well with the DAS. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly right. Yep. Um, and to even expand on that a little bit more, Brian, uh, it, to, to, to address that point, um, the, the compute resources that you would need to, to run a, a, a very lightweight client on your local machine, um, that, that's, where, that's where the benefit really happens. Um, mm -hmm. because, you are, because you are offloading the actual compute, the computing needs of what a desktop has to do in its everyday normal scenario to the cloud, um, you no longer have to rely on local computing power to, to, to get any of your work done. Um, so that, that really kind of hammers the point of, of, of it being uh, central, uh, centralized in that manner. Um, in addition to that, something that I always point out as well is that um, for something like uh, remote desktop, um, it, which is an absolutely valid way to, to, to connect to, to your internal IT resources, uh, th those, those resources are ultimately shared, right? Mm -hmm. Another right. advantage of desktop as a service is that every user is assigned a dedicated machine. So there, there are no, uh, this is what I call the, the noisy neighbor effect. Right. Um, none of that actually happens due to the nature of how, of how desktop as a service is. Um, and because the, the architecture is like that inherently by its nature, um, managing desktops, deploying them and, and, and securing them, it becomes that much easier. Yeah, I definitely wanna to touch on the security in a minute, but I, you talk about the noisy neighbor. I know we have seen and, and been involved in several 
large deployments of terminal servers and remote desktop services. And, and we've definitely seen, uh, you know, where you have one user that's in that shared resource, uh, you know, they decide to maybe download a large file or kick off a very uh, CPU intensive process, and then everyone suffers because of that. So it sounds like with this, it, since everybody's got their own resource pool that they're pulling from, then, uh, you know, you're sort of isolated from other people uh, and what they're doing on their machine. And I know that also can fit into security as well. So talk a little bit about what are some of the security advantages that you see with DAS uh, as it's deployed? Yeah, absolutely, Brian. And uh, and and to touch and to one make make one last comment about your previous point. That means uh, we can watch all the YouTube videos you want uh, without <laughs> without causing without causing a, a network crash. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but but yes, the the, the security aspect is, is also a, a, a huge factor of this. So uh, and I will kind of put a real world example around this. If I if I were on a plane and I left my and I left, I use a Surface Book and I left my Surface Book on the plane. Um, I I have I have al almost zero worries about anybody accessing accessing my my work desktop. And there's a couple of things that go into that. So a the the the, the multi factor authentication um, which is supported in DAS like that that is that is uh, obviously a deterrent. Um, I, I, you know, I have basic kind of security practices on my local machine, like encrypted drives and, and so on and so forth. Um, but for a, a very large part of me is not worried at all that, that a malicious hacker or, or anybody who knows what they're doing is, is going to access my dad's desktop. And there's a couple of factors that go into that too. Um, the fact that uh, we can absolutely just blow, blow away the, the the desktop instance itself and recreate a new one with with preloaded and pre-established company software and policies um, allows desktops to be absolutely disposable. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, in, 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 in this way, it, this is a design aspect, but nothing um, is supposed to be saved locally on the desktops. And this is kind of, this harkens back to what I was saying about how the infrastructure and the desktops live side by side. Mm -hmm. um, users, by best practice, should be saving everything to the servers themselves, and not necessarily on the desktops. So, um, what this what what this kind of uh, highlights is the fact that that DAS now becomes a vehicle. It's just a vehicle to access that to access those resources. Um, so, from that respect, it's I, I have I sleep a little bit better at night. Um, I, I, I am known to be harebrained from time, from time to time. And so if I leave something somewhere I'm not supposed to, uh, which, which I'm known for, I, 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 I sleep a little bit better at night just knowing that. Um, the, uh, another aspect of this is that um, for, for us who are familiar with, with Active Directory and how that plays into securing um, both a domain and, 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 and company policy, um, Desktop as a service is is highly integrated into how an organization runs their Active Directory as well. So that in combination with roaming profiles, it really becomes it, the desktops themselves really become disposable. Um, and and from a implementation standpoint, uh, the the desktops are all based upon what we call a golden image. So that's kind of to expand a little bit upon what I was talking about just a second ago about um, having a desktop that is that is that has preloaded and and pre-established uh, uh, security policies and and any kind of software and applications as well. So one of the things, a couple of things I point out from a security standpoint there, one is, you know, hey, your connection is encrypted, it's secure, and you have to use MFA to get on it. I, I think that that's, those are three really big items right the way just on the connectivity side. And the fact that, hey, your desktop basically is a dumb terminal. There's no data on it. Uh, you know, you, if it is lost or compromised, um, you know, locally, you don't have to worry about it. But I, I think one thing, uh, you talk about the Active Directory and the domain management. Uh, that's something we see in our assessments quite often that, hey, you may have a pool of machines, but the same, you know, security, uh, you know, properties are not always applied consistently across the network on every machine. And that's something we, we always see that as a lot of times a deficiency. So it sounds like that DAS can help solve that problem because you got an image that is already secure 
and then you just duplicate that image for any other user you need to. So that's uh, exactly correct. So that I, I see that as a very secure way to uh, to deploy, you know, workstations across a network. And and to me, you know, we we fought a lot of battles with work from home users. You know, they got to use VPN. You know, I hate to say it, but a lot of providers aren't cool with using VPN. Uh, you know, obviously the firewall comes into play there, and this seems like it would just streamline a lot of that connectivity, but also not give up any of the security along with it. Yeah, I want to before we exactly. move, before we move on from security, I want to mention too. As soon as a device for small businesses that we deal with mostly, as soon as a device leaves the office you lose a lot of control in that gateway security. So once you lose that and they take it home, not everybody has the tool set to keep the device then secure or, or, or filter what they can do. Um, so that also eliminates part of that because you know the device, you really don't care about the traffic on that device. Like, uh, like Paul said, it's pretty much disposable at that point. And you, and you lose nothing at the point of disposal, so. Yeah, I, I think this, I mean, it's obviously a great solution for, I know we're looking at, you know, more work from home scenario. We've discussed that. I know a lot of the companies are, are as well. We're, we're actually talking to them about this solution because I think, uh, you know, as companies are evaluating where they're at long term, this seems like just a, a great solution where you can, you can have all the security, you can have uh, all the access you need. Uh, and then you can have it, have it right there teamed with, with your infrastructure too, which is, uh, I think, a huge advantage as well. So, Paul, I'm going to let you demo it. Are you ready to do that? Yep, absolutely. All let right, me, so I'm um, going to stop the share on my uh, PowerPoint slide, and I'm going to push it over to you. Uh, I believe you have the ability to share your screen out, and I'll let you do that. And there you go. And you can sort of walk us through your daily experience since you are a daily DAS user. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. Thank you. Um, so if everyone can see my screen now, what we're actually yeah. looking at is that it, it, what we're actually looking at is my local desktop. Um, so uh, I, I logged into the Zoom meeting today through my local desktop so I could actually show um, from my perspective what DAS, what the DAS experience actually looks like. So um, we're looking at my local desktop here. Um, I, I, I do very little other uh, other types of work on here, but this is my main kind of, wh whenever I go anywhere, this is the device that comes with me. Um, so this is here, the Horizon client that I was, that I was referencing uh, just a little while ago. So um, as you can see, it's, it's, it's launching an application just like you would any other application, whether it be Zoom, Firefox, I have open as well right now. Um, and it leads you to this uh, very simplistic kind of login page. And, and from here, um, what I will do is actually log into my DAS instance. If I can type in my password correctly. And so, here, um, it's actually possible as well for a single user to have multiple desktops too. In in my particular case, I only have one, but if you if you if you so desired, you could have multiple of them. Um, and then I select the desktop, and this is what happens when I actually fire up my desktop machine itself. So. Right before, um, right before I logged into the Zoom meeting with Brian, what I did was just shut my desktop off. And I think what 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 is super apparent is that as soon as I logged in here, is that all of these applications were still up and there and they were running. So um, I kind of referenced this the other day, Brian, when we were talking about this. But for me, when I had and when I had uh, an office computer, uh, my laptop, and then my my home computer as well. What was really nice was that I would start my day at the office or start it on my laptop, move to the office. Um, it was the same, all my applications were the exact same. Um, they were opened and in the same exact positions that they were in before. Um, I would walk into my office, fire up my desktop as a service again, um, do all the work that I needed to do. And then maybe at lunchtime I had to, I had to go home or work from, work from a cafe or from Starbucks. Um, it provided an extremely seamless 
a way to move between my devices and then not worry about having to fire up all my applications again um, and try to find out where I was before. Um, so this, we're looking at my desktop right now, and 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 this is something that I think uh, it. It has a practical use, um, but it also surprises some folks as well. Um, this is obviously personalized. Um, yeah. If we're used to logging into um, an RDP session or or, or something similar, um, it, you would you would obviously find a super generic um, uh, a server OS maybe or or a very um, a unfamiliar view into what you are used to maybe looking at on a day to day basis. Um, for me. Because uh, we were just looking at my local machine, and I, I can actually, I can actually very easily go back to that. Um, this looks and feels exactly like my local machine. So, for those of us who worry about maybe transitioning to something like desktop as a service, um, just be rest assured that uh, there is not there's not anything new that you have to learn in terms of user functionality. Um, and something else that I wanted to wanted to point out is that a lot of my day-to-day uh, -day activity is it, it is browser based um, mm -hmm. so uh, there are probably some that that are that stick out to the viewers today you know slack I have outlook open up here as well OneDrive to um, and and then diving into a little bit deeper I opened outlook just just as an example here um, Excel I use on a, on a day-to-day -day basis too. So I still have access to all of the Microsoft tools that I use on a day-to-day -day basis um, while still having the, the kind of the freedom and, 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 and independent feeling of, of having a, a desktop that is my own, um, but at the same time of which I am not worried about at, at, at all. Yeah, I mean, that's a, I mean, basically you just have an icon on your local machine to click to get into this. I think one of the benefits I see is the transition. Uh, you know, it, it actually, this is a, this is a pet peeve of mine, but I mean, I, I loathe having to, okay, I got to shut down. I got to go somewhere. Then I'm going to come back or I have to get a client meeting, you know, and I, I'm one of those, I have a lot of applications open. We have a lot, we, we use Slack. So I've got that going in the background. Uh, so having to close all that down, log back in, uh, gosh, it would be so nice to like, just shut, shut my, browser and then open the browser back up to wherever I need to and hey there's my work I can pick up right where I left off uh, I see that as a huge efficiency gain uh, at least on my side would be very 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 beneficial to do that I'm sure others will see that as well what about local resources like the printer or transferring files to and fro not that I would recommend the files but you know is printing feel the same does it use like easy print or something along the lines of that like you know, terminal services does. Can you talk uh, talk about that a little, Paul? Lee, th thank you for bringing that up because I, I, I almost forgot about that. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, so yes, there is absolutely local printer capability. Um, if a printer is connected to a network, say maybe in the office, that the same kind of networking applies there as well. Um, from even diving in a little bit deeper, even uh, from a security, kind of harkening back to the security concept that we were just talking about, um, you can lock down uh, USB, USB uh, ports uh, for the, the machines for desktop as a service. So, uh, you know, users cannot necessarily be loading uh, data onto a USB to, 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 to do whatever they, they may with it. Um, so yes, to answer your question in, 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 in a more succinct manner, uh, that the printing capability of dual monitors, that that is absolutely possible with, uh, within desktop as a service as well. Yeah, I think that's a the dual monitors. I think that's something we're seeing with uh, the work from home scenario, but also in the office, people wanting. Uh, let's just face it: multiple monitors are better. The more you have, the better. So, I guess, does this work? I guess, do you run dual monitors at home, or what is your experience like with dual monitors? Is it the same as a normal machine hooked up uh, to a docking station then to those monitors? Yeah, Brian, absolutely. Um, so it, uh, for me, um, I, I run a kind of, it's, it's a bit unique. I run a vertical monitor and then also yeah. a, a horizontal monitor as well. Um, so it, it, it took a little bit of tweaking to, to get it to, to look correctly. But after, after the, the configuration side of it, it was, it was absolutely seamless. Um, my, my, I have a separate local machine here at home uh, that I use that also has dual monitors and, and just the fact uh, that it looks the exact same 
um, to me, that that is also a, a huge, huge advantage. So when you transition, say you go to that cafe and you work on, I think you said you're running a surface and you're on that single monitor. So when you go back in, into your home office with those two monitors, does it automatically recognize those two monitors there and, and go back to the normal settings or is that something you got to adjust every time? It is. Yep. So that is something that, that it'll automatically recognize it. Um, and it'll something, it, it's something that just pops up. Um, it, when, uh, obviously when I log into a, a, my dual monitor setup, uh, after I come home from Starbucks or whatever it may be, um, the second monitor that I normally work out of that is, that it, that looks like a, a naked desktop screen. Um, but that's totally fine. I'm able to drag all of my windows and all of my applications onto, onto my second monitor, uh, seamlessly. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, I think one of the big things to notice, I mean, is it's personalizable. Hey, you've got all your office applications. Obviously, you guys probably use Office 365 like we do, so it integrates well with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the printers and peripherals, uh, that's always, uh, you know, a big thing. We still have a lot of clients who, who and see a lot of companies who still generate a lot of print work and uh, also do some scanning as well. So uh, it's glad to know it would, it would st they're not going to lose the functionality uh, of those resources, uh, either at home or in the office, uh, you know, whether on the network or I guess attached directly to the machine. So, uh, any, I'm going to let you close out the demo there. Anything else that, uh, you want to tell us about, uh, you know, desktop as a service, uh, through the demo. Um, Brian, I think I, I, I really appreciate it. I, I think I have covered kind of the, the major talking points when, when it comes to DAS. I think this is, if I were to leave, um, a, a, a call to action, or if I were to leave a, a kind of a closing comment, I would say that uh, for for any organization kind of today dealing in, in the space, in the world of COVID particularly, um, and the fact that uh, the how, what our future may look like as, as in terms of working from the office, um, it, it may look uncertain. So uh, I, DAS is absolutely something that if we have not considered before, it is absolutely a conversation worth having. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, um, Brian, it comes down to you and I uh, to be able to pinpoint and create solutions uh, for end users, and that's that's exactly that's exactly what we we would do in this scenario. Um, if anything else, to 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 help evaluate whether desktop as a service would would actually help. Um, the, the organization as a whole. So um, that is what I will leave with the group is that absolutely, if this is something that we have not considered, um, then, then, then it may be ripe to have that conversation today. Yeah, I would, uh, I would definitely agree with that. I know as a, I'm hoping to see a lot more, you know, companies look to this as a solution. I think it's a great solution, um, especially if they are planning to do more uh, work from home or field a, a more, I, I'd say, widely filled a remote workforce. Uh, most of the companies I've talked to are planning to do that. And I think this is the probably the best long-term solution out there uh, for that workforce, given the flexibility it provides, uh, you know, the security it provides, uh, you know, and I think the, the end user experience is very, very seamless. Uh, for them as they move maybe from you know a, a common workspace to their house or maybe back to the office so uh well i appreciate the demo paul and uh let me let us jump on your 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 local and personal machine there and i'm going to all right there you go we stopped here i'm going to share my screen back and put it back just to close this out here um, let's see here uh, all right so uh, we do appreciate, uh, you know, your attendance and also viewing of uh, this webinar. We, like I said, we did record it. It will be on our YouTube page uh, as soon as we can get the recording, uh, you know, uh, processed. Uh, I really do appreciate you, Paul, uh, coming on board with us today and giving us this great presentation, um, not only in Green Cloud uh, yourself, but also a desktop as a service. I really see it as a, a great solution, and uh, I'm hoping we can, uh, you know, help others see it uh, that way as well. Brian, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, if uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, we can definitely uh, provide uh, information, additional information about Green Cloud. We can definitely uh, bring them in as a as a partner through Abacus Technologies to 
uh, you know, provide any of the services that they offer from cybersecurity to infrastructure as a service. And, and of course, as we've seen today, today uh, desktop as a service. So uh, I've got our team up there. So uh, you can contact me, uh, Samantha or Caroline as well, and we'll be happy to assist you and, and help you in any way that we can. So uh, we're signing off for today. Thanks a lot for your attendance. Thank you for your views and uh, hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot.